Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, could we commence proceedings? Uh, such a, uh, welcome, everyone, here to the sixth uh, distinct, Dean's Distinguished Lecture. And tonight we have a wonderful occasion here. It's not only a distinguished lecture, but a welcoming uh, uh, home. And I'll c get to that in a moment. But first, it is so wonderful to be seeing people, hearing people. You know, there's not little blank boxes on a, on a, on a TV, on your, on your laptop, talking into the void, um, that we can see friends, we can see colleagues, uh, uh, and meet people that has been three years on campus and I've never met them. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is great. We are here also, and this enables us to welcome back an alumni, alumnus, to the campus. Um, the evening is devoted to Justice Steve Majid. Um, and he is a very special alumnus because he is, in fact, UWC's first constitutional court judge, which is fantastic for us as a faculty. Um, you know, there can be many more, but you're the first. Someone must be the first. Set the tone and the example. So this is a very proud moment uh, for us here yeah, as, as a faculty, as a university, to uh, welcome you back. And so it's really a proud moment, a celebratory moment. Um, and you come back to a campus that looks fairly different from what, we, what was when you were here, students. Uh, the campus has changed, the faculty has changed, um, and uh, you have also been back uh, he hasn't left the, the, the faculty or the university when you left as a student, but uh, allow me just to say one personal note. Uh, you left, you eventually came to the Cape Bar, and there you worked very closely on the same floor with Dalla Omar. And when Dalla Omar came in 1990 to start the Community Law Center, um, we were sort of operating on the same, the same field, the same area, and when Dala left um, to become a politician, you were brought in to the trustee, to become a trustee of the Dala Omar Institute, as the Community Law Center was then uh, renamed. And we, you already were starting to give back uh, some of your, your experience to us, and we were very grateful, and therefore, from the Dala Omar Institute's uh, perspective. I'm not stealing any show here, but <laughs> welcome also. <laughs> um, because you were kept uh, your, your links with us. And even when you were a judge in uh, Northwest, in Kimberley, you made an effort to attend our, our meetings. We didn't have these Zoom meetings. You're a trustee, you attended meetings. So let me uh, say no more then because the real welcome is by our deputy vice chancellor now my first question to her um, is and I really ask you what are you doing here <laughs> you are most unwelcome <laughs> on the first of for those who didn't receive a notice, on the 1st of October, she started a sabbatical. That sabbatical had to start in somewhere in 2020. And here comes big COVID, and Vivian steps into the breach and runs the university through the, throughout the pandemic. And now, eventually, pandemic is gone, you are supposed to be on sabbatical, and yet you, on the first day of your sabbatical, <laughs> you're back. But it says a lot about you. 
um, that you put the institution before yourself, you take care, and welcome back from your sabbatical for the evening only. And so let me not say anything further. Uh, Professor Lavac, please uh, take uh, the podium. Thank you very much, Professor Staitler. Um, I'm always very nervous, colleagues, when, when Nico speaks uh, ahead of me because he has this habit of actually taking some of my speech. And then I have to um, quickly try and, and see what I can say in, instead. I'm very glad you didn't do it today, but I did want to say that I'm actually on sabbatical, but it's lovely to be at UWC as always. Um, I'm first going to look at our special guest here and say welcome to the sixth, and I need to get it right, not the distinguished dean, but the dean's distinguished lecture. Because <laughs> it happened at arts faculty one day when the, the sequence was right. This is the first one since 2019. And it's really such a pleasure to welcome our honorary professor, Justice Stephen Majid here tonight. His wife, Rubina, is sitting here. Rubina, lovely seeing you again. And all the alumni, if you don't mind, I would like us to be a bit more or less formal. If you can just wave all the alumni, I've seen quite a few familiar faces. You are most welcome here tonight. Um, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, uh, Professor Jacques de Vol, um, a fellow Dean, Professor uh, Ghala from the Arts and Humanities Faculty, and then our program director here tonight. Um, you've now already met uh, Professor Nico Staitler, and Professor Fisher will be doing the introduction, the formal introduction of Justice Stephen Arnold Majid. Welcome. As you know, the, if you look at the program, you would see that we started this in 2015, and I recall that very vividly because I did the same job then, 2015 opening the Dean's Distinguished Lecture when it was started, and no pleasure, at the, the bar was set very high by former Deputy Chief Justice um, Dijam Moseneke, who did our first one, and you would see in the program that um, he was followed by quite a few very, very, um, Eminent judges, Judges Navi Pillay in 2016, Edun Cameron in 2017, Bernard Nguepe in 2018, and the last one um, that we've done was at the CHS building where we quickly had to move because of a, a student protest and we had to move the function on that day, 2019, and that coincided with the faculty's 40 year celebrations for those that were there, and some of you that are here tonight, you were actually there as well. So um, that was our last one, and uh, Justice um, uh, Nafsar really um, critically looked at that topic and, and he engaged in such a way with us that I'm, I'm probably not, never going to forget that one. So thank you very much for, for doing this one uh, tonight. I want to quote something that's in the, and I asked him for his permission because, um, and I will elaborate uh, on that slightly later in, in my opening. If you look at the program, there's a beautiful quote from Justice Majid where he said about UWC as follows. UWC taught me the fundamental values of humaneness, equality, and respect for all people. It inculcated in me the mindset of justice for all and of standing up for the rights of the most downtrodden and marginalized. My UWC experiences, particularly politically, was a foundation for my later involvement in a multitude of human rights and public interest cases as a lawyer during the turbulent mid-1980s to early 1990s. I have strived to let this parad paradigm infuse my work as a judge, to render justice fairly and equally to all, regardless of one's station in life. And I'll come back to that theme when I talk about the person that Stephen is. The faculty, has been doing so well, and I would like to mention a few things. Justice Majid, you can be truly proud, and all the alumni here uh, present tonight, you can be truly proud of this faculty of law. If I just look at the evidence presented, in a sense, in the 2021, our reflective report, the following is very evident. The law faculty was listed for the second time in the Times Higher Education, or THE, 
World University Rankings, 2022 rankings by subject law, that was announced in November 2021. And according to the rankings, the UWC law faculty appears with four other South African universities, or law faculties in the uh, 201 plus band. Um, and the, these faculties are UKZN, Northwest University, UNISA, and Stellenbosch University. It is recognized as one of the top 10 uh, law faculties in South Africa. When we look at our student po population of the faculty, we have roughly about 2,809 students with a, that's, um, it includes undergrad and postgrad, and our postgrad ratio is 19.4%, which amounts to about 545 students. In respect of research, we've done tremendous work. If you think the DOI is our flagship, there are so many emerging flagships and it's a space to watch, quite an exciting space. We've established a research chair, and he's sitting over here, um, in constitutional design for divided societies to be held by Professor Jonathan Fisher and funded partially from the UCDG, uh, University Capacity Development Grant Funding and in, in the DVC R&I office. And at the end of 2021, 15 staff members had, a, had an NRF rating, that's a National Research Foundation rating, which includes one A rating and six B ratings. And in respect of staff development, at the end of 2021, 37 out of the faculty's 45 permanent staff members had doctorates, which amounts to 82%, which is quite high when one looks at it overall in relation to the university, but also in relation to the university sector. Well done to the law faculty. And just recently, I see uh, some of them here tonight. We were very fortunate about three uh, promotions uh, in the house. And to those of you, you would have received my letter. Uh, congratulations on your recent promotions. Two to associate professor and one to senior lecturer. Since 2020, the faculty hosts four departments. You are all aware of the Dalaoma Institute, the Law Clinic, and four new centers. And I want to expand a bit on the four new centers because they um, are where our emerging and our future research and our postgrad uh, programs will be emanating. And it's a space to watch. And we also have, since 2021, two research chairs. These exciting new centers are, I, I know them by the acronym, so I'm gonna say who, who they are, GALC, Global Environmental Law Center, CLEAR, that's the Center for Legal Integration in Africa, ACTCJ, which is the African Center for Transnational Criminal Justice, and CENTRO, and I see the, our newest appointee, Prof. Collier, sitting there, CENTRO, the Center for Transformative Regulation of Work. And it's my sincere hope that these centers, together with the new postgrad programs and the fact that our law faculty is starting the fourth year of our newly curriculated LLB, and they've, they've been, despite COVID, very successful in ensuring the student's success, irrespective of us having to move online, having to assess in a totally different way, and it didn't impact um, to, a, to, to the extent that one would have expected on their success rate. So well done um, to the faculty. So now we look forward to our sixth DDL. And as I said, the first since uh, 2019, and I want to go to that quote of Justice Majid, because I wanted to paint to you the picture that when you were speaking about the faculty, um, you were drawing on the political side, your social justice, and the, the, the way in which you view justice and looking out and, and fighting for the downtrodden, which, which really comes together in the way in which your career um, has unfolded. And in our conversation in 2019, you would recall, um, I, in fact, it was 20, 2017, 2018, I did a series of uh, what I called courageous conversations with alumni right across the country, and I was very fortunate to also have one in, um, in Kimberley. And I was sitting um, at the table with uh, uh, Justice Majid, and the one thing that he said, he might not remember, that struck me was that 
He focused on what he learned, as I quoted, from UWC and the humaneness and the sense of social justice, etc. But he said my critical thinking I had to hone after. And that struck with me because that led me to, to think that if we're really serious about our intellectual identity at UWC, it has to involve that critical, analytical thinking, problem-based problem um, solving skills, the kind of um, innovative creativity that we as lawyers so sorely also need in our profession. And, and that led us to a change in our graduate attributes, by the way, and I want to thank you for, for being honest and saying, but I actually had to hone my critical thinking and problem-solving skills post having left the university while still building on the ones that were, that were built here. So the experience with you um, in Kimberley, and I, I want to um, stand with this, showed me a, a person that hasn't forgotten his roots. He comes from Kenard, and he keeps on telling me I must call him Stephen, because those kind of titles for the person that you'll be meeting tonight, they're not important. He's not forgotten where he comes from. He stuck to his roots, including his UWC roots, and you will find the most humble person, our Honorary Professor Justice Stephen Majid. Professor Fisher will now formally introduce you but it's an absolute honor to welcome you here. Enjoy the evening with us. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today uh, to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Justice Stephen Majid. Uh, some of my points are already taken by Nico, so please, <laughs> um, there might be some repetition, I apologize for that. Uh, so it's not every day uh, that people who have gone out and conquered the world return home. Today is one of those rare days. Although he originally hailed from the Northern Cape, from parents who were both educators, Justice Stephen Majid, we would like to claim is the product of the University of the Western Cape, where he attended both his BA and LLB. It was also his UWC experiences that prompted his involvement and contribution in the liberation struggle by defending many political activists as an advocate. And we are very grateful that he hasn't forgotten his roots. We are excited about the collaboration he's currently initiating, a collaboration that potentially involves students and the staff of our law faculty and the School of Law at Howard University in the United States of America. Justice Majid joined the judiciary in March 2000 when he was appointed as acting judge in the Kimberley High Court. In 2010, he was appointed to the Supreme Court of Appeal. He continued to climb the ladder in the judiciary. Now, since 2019, he serves as a justice of the Constitutional Court. That's why Today's event doubles as a celebration of our achievement. Today, we are gladly reminded, but also not shy to remind others that we are a law faculty that has produced a justice of the Constitutional Court, the highest court of the land. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Justice Stephen Majid. Uh, good evening, everybody. I must say I'm barely recognizable from what I've heard from the back there. <laughs> Is this really me? It's a great honor to be a program director and uh, so many professors and real professors, not wannabes like me. <laughs> and so many familiar faces. Uh, it's so good to see you. I saw the two Abies there, Abby Dawson. I haven't seen him many years. My best friend here, Dinesh Giwala, a man who I could tell you lots about, mostly bad, but also some good. <laughs> we ran the elections in Kimberley in 1994. What a time to see how people go and vote to elect a first democratic government for this beloved country. And very intimidating presence of Laos and Naidu, one of our foremost constitutional commentators. 
and so many friendly faces and also my dear wife and a brother and his wife. And so I just want to say, uh, Professor Labak, Professor Staitler, Professor Festa, thank you for that, uh, for that very generous introduction. I truly love this place, I mean it. And when I was on the plane coming down, I realized I have two UWC ties. The one is dirty, the other one is clean. I should have at least tried and brought the, the clean one. Sorry about that. <laughs> now, they say you must start with an icebreaker, and so let me go and try it. And I'm very wary of time, but Nico, if you l allow me some latitude, I, I promise you there's a quid pro quo down the line. People often ask, um, why do the judges in the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal, the SCA, why do they call, are they call justices and the others are called my lord and my lady and your lordship? And ever since people started watching the Oscar Pistorius trial live, <laughs> blow by blow, irrelevant fact by irrelevant fact. I was in that appeal and I read the record and I wondered what was it all about, how far you can hear somebody scream and so on. There are two people in the house, one is dead, the other one is alive, he must explain what happened. That's the case. So people are very enthralled with this lady and your ladyship and so on. And so here's the truth, the story. There was a case years ago at the time when st things started changing about this nomenclature. And the case involved quite a huge accident uh, where there's a chain collision and uh, quite a long, lot of damage done to various vehicles. And so there were summonses issued against all these, uh, summonses issued by the, uh, the other vehicles and they sued this, this driver of this car that caused the accident. And they consolidated these actions. And so there's a trial running consolidated action in the High Court and uh, the primary point of the, of, of the accident was that this man was very drunk. And so the first witness comes and talks about how drunk this driver was who caused the accident and his counsel, his advocate, asks him a number of questions about the scene and so on, and he says to him, so uh, let's call the witness Mr. Mr. Josephs. Mr. Josephs, you say my client was very drunk? He says, yes, indeed. He says, would you say he was as drunk as a judge? He says, yes. <laughs> and then he carries on about the lighting and the visibility and the, was the surface wet, was it dry, and so on. And uh, was there enough room for an adequate lookout? And the normal questions, I mean, you know what it's all about. And then he comes back and he says to him, uh, you say he was very drunk? He says, yes. As drunk as a judge? He says, yes. And then the judge leans over and he says, uh, uh, Mr. Andrews, he says to counsel, I, I, this is the second time you make a slip. Surely you mean as drunk as a lord? He says, yes, my lord. <laughs> so after that, when the judges heard that in the Constitutional Court and the SCA, they said, no more. We'll be justices henceforth. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, President Nelson Mandela famously exhorted all of us that, quote, to deny people their human rights is to deny, very, to deny their very humanity, close quote. He cautioned that, and I quote again, a nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones, close quote. These observations by our most famous citizen ever assumes particular pertinence when I talk about a topic like the one year. It is often said that law is but a means to achieve justice. And this then begs the question, how has the Constitutional Court fared in the respect of the enforcement of socioeconomic rights? I propose in this lecture first outlining the historical perspective. I will then wade into the challenging debate concerning minimum core obligations, briefly deal with a few selected cases from the Constitutional Court, and then conclude with my views on the question. It is ever important that I make a disclaimer right from the outset. At the risk of stating the obvious, I am not speaking here for our court. In fact, there may conceivably be some of my colleagues who hold views diametrically opposite to my own. And as I'm, in as much as I now hold an honorary position in this esteemed law faculty of this venerable institution for which I have so much affinity, even less do I presume to speak on its behalf. So with that out of the way, let me try and grasp the nettle. 
I uh, chose this challenging topic myself. It lends new meaning to the phrase volenti non fit in urea. <laughs> but I must emphasize that I think this is particularly important, that this is meant to be the introduction to a more comprehensive debate about this very important issue. I hope to facilitate panel discussions and debates with the leave of my boss, the, the Dean, by retired Constitutional Court Justices. They are much better suited than I am because they got nothing to lose, they're retired. <laughs> and academics on this topic in the forthcoming months here at UWC. Colloquially speaking, then, I'm merely getting the ball rolling today. So at the start, perhaps we need to remind ourselves again of the place of socioeconomic rights, or as it's often called second generation rights, juxtaposed against civil and political rights, which we often call first generation rights. Now, in my view, despite this numerical categorization, there's hardly any difference between these rights. There does appear to be some reticence to accord socioeconomic rights their proper state status within the human rights discourse. The central question, as far as I'm concerned, in the inquiry ought to be, what is the nature of the ob obligation created by the different rights? Both of these sets of rights trigger concomitant obligations, a primary duty to respect, a secondary right to protect, and a tertiary duty to fulfill. Thus viewed, it becomes plain that there is substantial overlap between these two sets of rights. And then I think the differentiation is more apparent than real. So let me take a very simple example. The right to life, which is a first generation right, as we all know, can conceivably encompass the right to health, a decent livelihood, and even housing. These are second generation rights, of course. And this is the route that the Indian Supreme Court has taken. I may just add that um, I'm going to make the, the paper available afterwards for, for, for dissemination, so uh, you'll see the, the authority referred to there. First then, the historical perspective. In the negotiations which led up to the 1993 interim constitution and the 1996 constitution, there was a lively debate not only in academic circles but also among the public at large as to whether socioeconomic rights should be included in the constitution and if so, the form in which they should be included. The liberation movements were generally very firm proponents of their inclusion. Their concern was that the recognition of political and civil rights in the supreme law should be accompanied by express provisions requiring the redress of social and economic disadvantage. Professor Liebenberg notes that clauses in the Freedom Charter that related to land, housing, education, and health found resonance in particular with the ANC and its supporters, hence their strong support for the inclusion of socioeconomic rights in the Constitution. And she cites President Mandela's May 1991 address to an ANC constitutional conference where he said, and I quote, a simple vote without food, shelter, and health care is to use first generation rights as a smokescreen to obscure the deep underlying forces which dehumanize people. It is to create an appearance of equality and justice while by implication, socioeconomic inequality is entrenched. We do not want freedom without bread, nor do we want bread without freedom. We must provide for all the fundamental rights and freedoms associated with a democratic society." Close quote. Within the ANC, two of the st strongest proponents of the inclusion of socioeconomic rights were Dalla Omar and Albi Sachs. There was also support from some of the smaller parties and some academics. <clears throat> the drafters of our constitution, after extensive and intensive negotiations, had to decide whether to include socioeconomic rights and if so, to consider an appropriate mod model. Now, there are three options to choose from. First, on the one end, notwithstanding the strong push for inclusion, to include no socioeconomic rights provisions at all to steer clear of the myriad pitfalls they may present. Second option was on the other extreme end, a fully justiciable socioeconomic rights provision with no limitation at all on its enforcement. And then, of course, in the middle, the via media with a limited justici justiciability clause enforceable only with regard to the reasonable availability of resources and a progressive realization of the rights. Now, of course, as we, as we all now know, the negotiators and later parliament settled for the via media. The Constitutional Court, in certifying the 1996 Constitution in compliance with the 34 constitutional principles, dismissed objection, objections to the inclusion of socioeconomic rights in the Constitution. 
The first objection to the, uh, by the objectors to the inclusion was that they are not universally accepted fundamental rights. Well, the court held that such an objection cannot be sustained because constitutional principle 11 permits the Constitutional Assembly to supplement the universally accepted fundamental rights with other rights not universally accepted. Second objection was that the inclusion of these rights was inconsistent with the separation of powers required by Constitutional Principle 6 because the, the judiciary would have to encroach, encroach upon the proper terrain of the legislature and executive. The objectors argued that it would result in courts making orders which have direct implications for budgetary matters. And the court held that while it is true that the inclusion of socioeconomic rights may result in courts making orders which have such implications, it pointed out that even when a court enforces civil and political rights such as equality, freedom of speech, and the right to a fair trial, those orders may often have budgetary implications. This latter pronouncement by our highest court fortifies my view that the claimed divide between first generation rights and second generation rights is illusory. Our Bill of Rights does not establish rigid hierarchies, nor does it draw a hard distinctive line between different types of rights. The third objection concerned the justiciability of these rights. The Constitutional Court made short shrift of this contention. It said that the mere fact that socioeconomic rights may have budgetary implications was not an automatic bar to their justiciability. And, said the court, at the very minimum, socioeconomic rights can be negatively protected from improper invasion. So with that historical ba background, I discuss next the vexed question of minimum core obligations. Now I'm wading into deeper, deeper water. Let's hope I swim, not sink. <laughs> as we all know, the second generation rights in our constitution, as I've said, impose concomitant duty on the state, and this is the important one, to quote, take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of this right. I mean, this is all known to all of us, but I'm going to read it again. The state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of this right. A difficult question that arises time and time and time again is whether there ought to be a minimum core to these rights. The concept of a minimum core obligation refers to the obligation on, on, the st on a state to ensure that no significant number of individuals is deprived of what people call the minimum essential levels of socioeconomic rights. This obligation is premised on the notion that there is a minimum core of socioeconomic entitlements based on the notion that a basic minimum level of subsistence is required for the enjoyment of a dignified human existence. The Constitutional Court has firmly rejected that pr proposition to substantial chagrin in some quarters. It did so in Grootboom, Treatment Action Campaign, and Mazibuko. I will discuss these cases, but I will do so briefly in the interest of time. In Mazibuko, the court followed Grootboom and Treatment Action Campaign too, noting that these same arguments concerning the minimum core of a right were rejected in those cases. The court summarized the reasoning for this conclusion in those two cases as being twofold. First, it flows textually from the Constitution itself. And secondly, for a proper understanding of the true role of the courts in our constitutional democracy, that is the separation of powers principle. This latter reason has come in for severe criticism from the variety of critics of the Constitutional Court's socioeconomic rights jurisprudence. So I shall return late to this later when I discuss the selected cases that I've referred to. I need to say something briefly about the minimum core concept. It's, it's received the endorsement of the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, I call it UNCESCR for short, in interpreting state parties' obligation under the covenant of those rights. Distilled to its essence, the primary reason for re the rejection of this concept by the Constitutional Court in Grootboom and Treatment Action Campaign 2, apart from those enunciated in Mazibuku, and I set out in the footnotes what, uh, what those judgments say. Those reasons appear to be A, that socioeconomic needs will vary according to the varying contexts, the lack of information to determine the, the, the content of minimum core obligations weighed heavily on the court, 
The text of the relevant provisions, that is, that resource constraints and progressive realization limit the rights. The fourth one is for pragmatic considerations, that minimum core obligations would impose unrealistic demands on the state in as much as it is impossible to give everyone access even to a core service immediately. And lastly, that imposing such an obligation was incompatible with the role and institutional competence of courts. The Constitutional Court has in place of a minimum core obligation, instead laid emphasis on an inquiry into the reasonableness of the measures taken by the state to realize the particular socioeconomic rights. And I quote Grootboom in the text, but I'm not going to repeat it now in the interest of time. I think that passage makes clear that what the court is concerned about is an inquiry into reasonableness. Did the state act reasonably in the steps that it taken? And it's not for the court to second guess uh, the state in its organs, uh, but, to, but to do that review of reasonableness. Uh, this approach has been consistently followed by our apex court, based on the constitutional court's earliest, early socioeconomic rights jurisprudence. Professor Liebenberg identifies the following features that the reasonable government program would have in the context of socioeconomic rights, and I quote it. It must be capable of facilitating the realization of the right. It must be comprehensive, coherent, and coordinated. Appropriate financial and human resources must be made available for the program. It must be balanced and flexible and make appropriate provision for need in the short, medium, and long term. Long term, it must be reasonably conceived and implemented. It must be transparent and efficiently made known, efficiently made known to the public. And it must make provision for short term uh, in the short term for those whose needs are urgent and who are living in intolerable conditions. In summary, the court has consistently ref resisted the urging upon it to intrude in the domain of elected institutions of democracy, which are eminently more suited to make policy-laden decisions. Now, let me just uh, depart from the text uh, for, a, for a short while, and that's always dangerous to do, but let me say this. It is incredibly hard to sit in a court with other colleagues to know that you are the last stop, that this is the station where everybody must get off, as they tell you on the how train. The train doesn't go further than this. And it's incredibly hard to see cases where, just on sheer empathy, your heart is with those people. But then there's a small little book I don't know if you've seen the recently hard-bound copy. It looks lovely that, uh, to celebrate the 25 years of the Constitution last year. It's a lovely little book. And it reminds you that you are not at large, that you are bound by what is written in that little book. And the Constitution puts a break on us when it comes to these kind of hard, very hard decisions. And I'll talk about a case that I really feel very strongly about, and I guess you, some of you would know which case that is. Fuller explic ex explicates that disputes which are policy laden arise in litigation that give rise to many diverging issues, each of which is linked to the other in a complex web of interdependent relationships. The constitutional court's reasoning in rejecting the minimum core approach can in general be said to be based on the concepts inflexibility and absolutism and the fact that it cannot deal with the exigencies of the real world. By that I mean a real South Africa, as well as the limitations imposed by the scarcity of resources. The court in its early days opted instead to a more flexible approach which is sensitive to the difficulties, difficulties for the state of realizing these rights. Now, I've alluded to the criticism leveled against the Constitutional Court's socioeconomic jurisprudence, something about which I will say, uh, say a little bit more later. At this juncture, it will suffice to state that generally, the criticism is aimed at the court's jettison jettisoning of a minimum core obligation and imposing, as I've said, the reasonableness test. Critics say that this, the court's focus is misdirected. There is an um, underemphasis by the court on the content of the various rights in issue and a consequent lack of analysis of the content of these rights. Any inquiry into the reasonableness of the measures to, re to realize progressively the right in question, say the critics, requires first and foremost that proper content be given to the right. 
Only then, as a next step, can the reasonableness of the measure to, measures to realize progressively the right in question be assessed by a court. So, short and sweet, they say that we've got it the wrong way around. The cart is before the horse. Turning then from these general observations to specifics, a discussion of selected socioeconomic rights decided in the apex court. Now, I'm also going to deal with Subramoni, apart from Khrudbom Treatment Action Campaign, Mazibuko, and the most recent one, Tubakale. My sequence of discussion is, is, is deliberately chronological. I'm, I hope that in doing it this way, it may be of some help to analyze how the court's jurisprudence has evolved. Some cynics may say it hasn't evolved, it's gone backwards. Although, as will become plain, many will say that, as I've said, uh, we've retrogressed. So I start with Subramoni. You'll recall, and uh, forgive me if I make the wrong assumptions that most of you will know these cases. They are some of the court's leasing, leading cases. And Mr. Subramoni had a, had a serious renal, renal fa failure uh, coupled with cardiac and diabetes-related problems. Uh, he sought an order that the state should render to him life-saving dialysis. He relied on Section 27 of the Constitution, as we know, the right to access to health care. Now, the court decided that Mr. Subramoni's claim based on the right to emergency medical treatment had to be rejected. That right to emergency care could be claimed by or on behalf of someone who collapsed suddenly or was the victim of sudden trauma. It did not apply to chronic medical conditions, even if they reached life-threatening proportions. The court recognized that there was a scarcity of funds and of capacity in the health system, and it held that in the respect of the right of access to health care, the access granted by the state health services to Mr. Subramoni had not shown to be unreasonable. It dealt with the evidence and, uh, from the hospital and in the main judgment, which was penned by Chaskelson P., held that the obligations imposed on the state in respect of access to housing, health care, food, water, and social security are dependent upon the resources available for such pur purposes and that the corresponding rights themselves are limited by reason of the lack of resources. In a separate concurrence, Sachs J noted that socioeconomic rights are different in their mode of enjoyment, if not in their essence, from civil and political rights, the first generation rights. He observed that the problem in all socioeconomic rights cases is that resources are always limited. Then came Khrudbum, a landmark decision on the justiciability of socioeconomic rights. It comes from a community that my wife and I, and I think Granul and Joy would remember well, in the times of the early days of the UDF's uh, establishment, we lived in the Cryfontein area, and Wallace Dean, the area from which this come, uh, we did a lot of work in that area in Wallace Dean, so we know, we know the Wallace Dean area and all the travails there. Then it was called something else, I can't remember, it was later named after Wallace Mugoki, who many of you would know. <clears throat> Mrs. Khurdbom and many other destitute occupiers sought an order that the local municipality in Cape Town be compelled to meet its constitutional obligations and provide them with temporary accommodation. That case answered the question early on during the new constitutional era regarding whether socioeconomic rights can be regarded as fundamental rights enforceable directly by the courts, and if so, how. The challenge that faced the constitutional court head on in that case was how to find a secure jurisprudential foundation for responding to the applicant's desperate situation, and was truly desperate, and how to provide a remedy consonant with the state's limited institutional capacity, and which was capable of meaningful enforcement. That was a unanimous judgment, where the court held that the central concept in the provisions on access to adequate housing was the obligation on the state, there's that term again, to take a reasonable legislative and other me measures progressively to realize this right. In its view, the concept of reasonable measures was, was one capable of being adjudicated on by the court. And if the measures failed to meet the standards of reasonableness, then the state would, uh, would be in breach. We know that the court found that the housing program of the city of Cape Town was inadequate, and it sent the city back to the drawing board to remedy that program. And many critics say, say that was inadequate. And as we all know, Mrs. Irene Grootboom died without ever getting her house. Treatment Action Campaign 2 considered government policy in respect of the provision in the public health, health sector of navirapine, an antiretroviral drug that drastically reduces the likelihood that the HIV virus will be transmitted from mother to child 
at birth. I see it's in the news again, uh, a former president says HIV doesn't, doesn't cause AIDS, the virus doesn't cause AIDS. Fortunately, I don't have to go there. <laughs> the manufacturers of nevirapine offered the drug free of charge to the government, and government made it available only to a small segment uh, of clinics because they were running a, a program. The applicant, the TAC, sought to persuade government to accelerate the program to provide the drug beyond the selected research and training sites, but government uh, dug in its, he its heels. The court considered the objections that the government made against prov in providing the drug beyond the research, research sites, rejected all of them in turn, and considered a number of factors that were relevant to determining whether the policy of the government was, re was, was reasonable. Again, I, I urge you to, to read the paper uh, for more detail. But the point that I want to make is this. The court's ultimate decision turned on reasonableness because the court, after examining all these objections, analyzing them, found that the policy of confining the provision of nevirapine to research sites, sites was unreasonable and in contravention of the state's obligations in terms of Section 27 of the Constitution. Then Mazibuko. This case was also unanimously decided, but it's the one that's come in for the most severe criticism, as many of you would know. The issue concerned the proper interpretation of Section 271B of the Constitution, which provides that everyone has the right to have access to sufficient water. The court was acutely aware of the importance of water. Water is truly life, and it's not just a cliche. The court's primary inquiry was into the role of the courts in determining the content of social and economic rights. That is how to interpret Section 27. As I've said, it rejected the, uh, the minimum core obligation argument following Grootboom and Treatment Action Campaign. And it said ordinarily it is institutionally inappropriate for a court to determine precisely what the achievement of any particular social and economic right entails and what gov steps government should take. The last of the five cases, and I'm not ducking the issue, but it's the one where I was part of the bench. The other four I have to follow by precedent. But in this one, I was part of the bench, and that's a case that's very close to my heart. It's Tupacale. When you read the facts, I wrote the main judgment, uh, and when you read, but I was in the minority. When you read the facts of that case, it, uh, it must move you, as it did me. Those applicants were living in the most terrible conditions. No water, no sanitation, living in tiny houses, up 10 people each, and they had no financial means to sustain themselves. The terrible thing of it all was that as long ago as in 1995, they all got subsidies from government. They were shown plots where their houses were going to be built. And we decided this case last year, remember, by 2021, they had no house, no plot, all gone through sheer incompetence and in some instances corruption. As I said, I wrote the first judgment which held that the local authority had failed to discharge its duties under Section 26 of the Constitution. That's the right to adequate housing. And I laid much emphasis in that judgment on the fact that in this case, Tubakale, we'd moved beyond Khrudbum. It was no longer a question of whether the state has, uh, has set reasonable housing policy. The policy was there, the Housing Act, the Housing Code. In fact, based on the legislation, the Act and the Code, they'd, as I said, they'd received subsidies. Subsidy and no house. So I reasoned that the state had failed to comply with a court order which required it to provide housing. That was the High Court's order. In light of the magnitude of the state's failures, I ordered the local authority to pay constitutional damages as an effective and appropriate remedy. The case concerned constitutional damages. I traversed all the options available to them. And as I say, that was, what, 26 years down the line. And I found that constitutional damages as the only effective remedy as Section 38 of the Constitution requires. Mine, sadly, was the minority decision. Jafta Jay, my colleague who penned the second judgment, found that this was not a case that called for constitutional damages. In his view, constitutional damages are not appropriate in cases that concern breaches of socioeconomic rights. 
that particular finding has, has raised an outcry. I say no more than that because uh, as a minority, I am bound by the majority. No proper case was pleaded for constitutional damages held Jafta J, and there was no proof of any damages, let alone constitutional damages. A third judgment by Matlanga J, elected not to go as far as to hold that constitutional damages could never be claimed for breaches of socioeconomic rights, as was held by Jafta J. That judgment found that the applicants had not made out a case for such damages. And the matter is now before the High Court again for the third time to allow the local authority to adduce further evidence. Now for the most difficult part of the lecture. Nico, how am I doing for on time? I'm fascinated. Okay. <laughs> I know the advocates are saying these judges, they always restrain us on time, but they never know how, when to stop. <laughs> Forgive me, please, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm now going to turn to an assessment of the validity of the criticism of the Constitutional Court's socioeconomic rights jurisprudence. Now, of course, all of you will know immediately that I have a vested interest in all of this. I'm subjective, I'm still a part of the court, and after I had uh, chosen this topic and I started working on this, and I thought to myself, what are you doing? And uh, I said to colleagues earlier this afternoon, to, uh, um, to Jonathan and to Vessel and to Jacques, uh, I think I'm on a kamikaze mission. <laughs> Is it true that as some assert the court has, through its socioeconomic rights judgments, deferred the dreams and aspirations of the millions of South Africans who continue almost three decades after the passing of the interim constitution in 1993 to live in abject poverty in the most unequal society in the world. And you will know that there was, a, there was research that came out fairly recently that shows South Africa is now officially the most unequal society in the world. Has the court been misguidedly tolling the bell of lack of resources? That comes from an English case uh, which was quoted in, in Subramoni by, by Albi Sachs. <clears throat> I've already provided a brief summary of the gravamen of the main criticism in general terms, but I need to focus on Mazibuko, which has come in for particularly strident reproval. Some people go as far as calling it a controversial judgment. In the main, the criticism against Masibuku is directed at the court's perceived inertia and for being overly deferential to the policy choices of the first respondent, the city of Johannesburg. That case, Masibuku, is said by critics to have considerably narrowed down the reasonableness standard set in the earlier cases of Grootboom and Treatment Action Campaign 2. In other words, not only say the critics, reasonableness should not be the inquiry, the content of the right should be the starting point at least. But Bazibuko has gone further and has narrowed down that reasonableness criterion in itself. Uh, Professor Liebenberg's forceful criticism is insightful. You'll notice that I keep on quoting Sandy Liebenberg. That is because she's one of the fiercest proponents of the minimum core obligations. And uh, I thought I'll grasp the nettle and not shy away from, from, from the most strident criticism. Liebenberg bemoans the fact that the, code the, the court there appeared to have significantly retreated from its earlier substantive reasonableness standards. And uh, I've quoted the passage uh, above that you'll see in the paper, and she says that one is particularly odious. She doesn't call it that. That's just my paraphrasing. And I, I quote other critics who, who say the same thing. But here's the thing that I need to quote in full because Professor Liebenberg in criticizing Mazibuku, uh, I would say, what do you call the, the person that sings in, uh, in the four? Uh, you would know, Vivian. I mean, you come from, from that kind of family there. The leading chorister in the chorus. Lead the lead vocalist, thank you. She concludes, quote, the court's early jurisprudence on socioeconomic rights has the potential to in evolve into a rich, substantive set of normative criteria for guiding fundamental social and economic reforms in South Africa. It is regrettable that in Mazibuku, the court chose to place the narrowest possible construction on these criteria and to engage in a superficial analysis of the impact of the city's water policies on the Piri community, Piri is in Soweto. Revisiting and developing the early potential of the court's approach to socioeconomic rights is a major challenge for the constitutional adjudication of claims to decent social and economic services 
and benefits over the next decade. And I think Sandy was write, writing this and saying, we're watching you guys, what are you going to do in the next 10 years? The criticism of Mazebuko encompasses not only the constitutional right dimension, but also an environmental law perspective. I'm going to jump ahead and say that, just in summary, that many critics say that this reasonableness review sounds too much like an administrative law review. That is well known to, to all of us around here. Is it rational? Is it reasonable? A PAJA review, a legality review? And they say that is not how a court, particularly an apex court, should deal with socioeconomic rights in a constitutional context. David Burchett's <coughs> whom I was lucky, well, I don't know if I was lucky, but I was, I met David when I was over at, in Oxford recently, and he is a former law clerk of the Chief Justice, late Chief Justice Langa, and he writes stridently against the court's jurisprudence. And I always tease David to say, well, you know, some of these judgments your judge, Pius Langa, was part of, you were his law clerk, what, how, what hand did you have in these judgments? And then he says to me, don't remind me of my past. <laughs> and we all say that. Burchett says there's a need for the court to clarify the state's obligations imposed by socioeconomic rights. This would entail that the state is not left with an amorphous standard with which to judge its own conduct, but would be able to assess its conduct against clear benchmarks. And he, he is vehemently opposed to... Uh, to that kind of approach. Now, <clears throat> this is where the kamikaze mission starts. None of the commentators, as far as I'm aware, take issue with the court's earlier approach that on the plain wording of the constitutional text, there is a reasonableness requirement coupled with a progressive realization of these rights. That wording, as all of us who've done interpretation of statutes know, must must be understood within the context of a new democratic state being called upon to transform a society burdened by the yoke of many decades of institutionalized segregation, grossly unequal opportunities, which in turn was preceded, preceded by centuries of colonialism along the same ideological lines and with the same devastating impact. The new democratic state's mandate to correct centuries of inequality and repression emanates from a transformative constitution whose drafters calculatedly, in my view, chose in respect of the inclusion of socioeconomic rights a limited justiciability clause enforceable only with regard to the reasonable availability of resources and a progressive realization of the rights. We must read the words as judges as they stand in the constitution. We can do no more than that. And I know our, our critics somehow say, well, that's not right. I don't know why it's not right. One thing I was taught as a judge, I mean, I came from a very small division, Northern Cape High Court. You know, they used to say there, uh, Jacques, Bavian, Nico, uh, in Kimberley, there happens, nothing happens every minute and it lasts the whole day. <laughs> so I was a judge in the Kimberley High Court. And I was taught early on in that very small division that as, well, as far as you can when you write a judgment, make sure you quote your own judgments, earlier judgments. <laughs> and I love quoting my judgment in the Constitutional Court when I was acting there in 2014, cool ideas. And cool ideas tells us how we must interpret the statute. And you must always start with the words. Now, if the critics of this minimum core obligation as opposed to reasonable requirements can just show me how we can get past the wording in the text, oh, please be my guests. They can come over immediately and come and persuade me. I think the drafters chose, as I've said, the via media when deliberating on a, on a suitable model exactly because they understood the challenges that South Africa will have. Where legislation in this instance, our supreme law, is plain and unambiguous, courts must give effect to what the legislature was seeking to achieve. Where a, a right is clear where a right in clear and explicit language renders that right subject to the rider that the state must take a reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of the right, effect must be given to that plain, unambiguous proviso. And that is exactly, ladies and gentlemen, what I think the court has done in its early socioeconomic jurisprudence. 
Its reasoning in, the, in those cases bears testimony to a careful and meticulous traversing of this very challenging terrain. So I think the fierce criticism to which I've alluded uh, loses sight of this first fundamental and I would suggest insurmountable obstacle in their contentions. That is the clear language of the proviso. But there's a further problem. Accepting for the moment that reasonableness is a less than satisfactory tool for some or all of the reasons advanced by the critics, the minimum core concept is itself hardly the panacea advocated for. It is jurisprudentially unsound, I say with great respect. And you know when the lawyer tells you in court, I say it with great respect, uh, Justice, then you must know the opposite is true. That's the lawyers, that's not me, eh? <clears throat> but there's, a, as I've said, a further problem. It's not a panacea advocated for. Jurisprudentially unsound, it's considerably more unsound than reasonableness. Unreasonableness. I, may, I must make the point right up front, ladies and gentlemen, that it is a treacherous path to simply follow the route that the UN committee has tread, because there's a lot of reliance on, 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 on those documents emanating from the committee. The court in Grootboom rightly pointed to the lack of information before that court in respect of minimum court obligations compared to the wealth of information that was available to the, to the committee, the UN committee. And my first conceptual difficulty with minimum core rights is this. When we establish the minimum core of a right, is the particular right, for example, the right to access to healthcare or to housing, the, ones, the most well-known, is it an absolute right or is it relative? Put differently, is the content of the minimum core determined by the state's resources so that the minimum core differs between countries depending on the resources available, their respective wealth? Or, on the other hand, is the minimum core an absolute, a given, in the sense that it is identical for all states? Must the South African reality be taken into account? Or are the state's obligations in spec, in spec of the minimum core of the right exactly judged as it would be judged in South Africa as it would be in, say, the US or Germany? Does it matter that we are concerned here with an emergent democracy and a third world economy battling to correct the ravages of a terribly skewed past allocation of resources, a system that was, was sidelined side and isolated as the pole cat of the world with significant impact on its economic health and access to foreign aid funding. The answer to me, ladies and gentlemen, seems to be self-evident. Minimum core proponents would demand that the core of the right must be absolute. It can be no other way because relativism would not work because the reasonableness approach which the Constitutional Court, true to the text, follows already does exactly that. It determines the resources available to the state so as to ascertain what the content of the right is. Because the two are inextricably linked to each other in all the legislative provisions. So, the minimum core must be a moving target and it must depend on what the state can afford. The Grootboom ap approach would be no good for the absolut absolutists because in Grootboom the court said both the content of the obligation as well as the reasonableness of the measures employed to achieve the result are governed by the availability of resources. That's no good for the proponents of the minimum core obligation. They would say that point of departure is fallacious. It must start with the content and the ambit of the right in question, as I've said. Absolutism, as far as I can see, implies that there's an innate, rigid, universal set of entitlements within, for example, housing, which represents the minimum that each individual requires to lead a dignified life to be determined quite regardless of what the state does and does not have. And this absolute, uh, uh, absolutist approach loses sight, I think, of the fact that in fulfilling socioeconomic rights, there's constant tension between needs and resources. And so I'm jumping ahead now. You can read the paper in, in due course. I mean, when you can't sleep at night, please read this paper. <laughs> it should put you to sleep, I think. That brings me to the second conceptual difficulty, the lack of specificity with regard to the minimum core. The protagonists of this say that there need, there need not be a rigid definition of the core. It would suffice to, and I'm quoting one of the, of the articles, to define the general principles underlying the concept, underlying the concept of minimum core obligations in relation to socioeconomic rights, and applies, apply these casuistically on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, there are some, believe it or not, who write in favor of the court's jurisprudence, and Lehman is one of the current Lehman. She says that 
The lack of specificity from those who urge the adoption of the minimum core and who themselves argue that, uh, that it requires a ranking of interest is unsurprising. There exists no principal basis on which the court can rank the interests of claimants when the interests are in incommensurable. The third problem that I have is that human rights concern individuals, not the collective. Individual rights must always trump those of the collective. And individual rights can only be limited within carefully circumscribed parameters under section 36 of the Constitution, which tells us that the law of general application can limit a right, but only subject to those five or six strict uh, provisos. So that's the essential difficulty with locating the right within its context content as the minimum core protagonists advocate. Surely, ladies and gentlemen, a litigant who, who comes to court to assert the socioeconomic right must demonstrate, at least prima facie, that resources are available to meet the need asserted. The court cannot merely assume that it is the case. Some basis must exist for the court to examine the public purse to assess the availability of resources. So I'm reaching a conclusion. <clears throat> I must tell you, I've jumped ahead a little. And as I say, the time uh, is against me. It's been 22 years since I stood in a court where the judge said, your time is up. <laughs> in conclusion, my disinclination towards a minimum core approach and preference for the apex court's reasonableness approach must by now be plain to all of you. And I'm sure there are no surprises there. I believe that the latter approach, the reasonableness approach, is true to the wording the context and the objectives of the text. And most importantly, it recognizes the exigencies of the South African situation. Undoing centuries of terrible deprivation within limited and ever shrinking means in the face of ever increasing demands based on justified needs is no small task. But the courts, even ours with all the vast powers that it has, and when you travel overseas and you talk to other lawyers, academics, judges, professors, they tell you that you have an amazing constitution with extensive powers, but we have to stay in our lane. We cannot move beyond the constitution. In adju and adjudicating the hard socioeconomic rights cases, the resource implications of positive duties might require difficult choices to be made. And I contend that the balancing of, of priorities is a process which ought to be undertaken by those who are directly accountable to the electorate, not by unelected judges, regardless of how much power they wield. Judges should never get involved in policy making because they may easily err, uh, and even if they get it right, an overly intrusive ruling made in good faith and with the best of intentions may well have unintended adverse consequences for the fiscus and beyond. Our courts and our highest court in particular have taken an understandably different approach to socioeconomic rights and, uh, ed adjudication. For that, the court has endured and continue to endure severe criticism. But let me try and end on a positive note for those who, who are opposed to the reasonableness review that the court has followed. For those people harboring in this room an acute sense of disappointment and those beyond, it may not be all doom and gloom. With a great deal of unashamed subjectivity, I commend to you a close reading of the main judgment in Tubakale. There's a growing lobby of commentators who suggest that the way forward or out of our South African socioeconomic rights adjudicative conundrum is that in order to determine whether the state is progressively realizing the right does not require the court to courts to specify the means, but rather to develop criteria to assess, from a deliberative standpoint, the state's definition of the requirements of the right and the state's explanation of its chosen means to move towards that end. There's a subtle difference, there's a subtle nuance here, but I think you can see it, or at least I hope. These criteria say commentators can be derived, and these are mostly post tubakale these criteria can be derived from the underlying principle behind incorporating rights, giving rise to positive duties into, into a constitution. And in South Africa, those fundamental values are explicit, we all know them, dignity, equality, and freedom. That is our mantra. 
And the state's duties to fulfill the socioeconomic rights in the Constitution are not simply aspirational, but require evidence of steps taken and of an interpretation of the right which enhances the, the, these values. And again, borrowing from my judgment in Tubakhale, I dealt there with a question of access to housing with spatial injustice. I mean, you would know that we uh, the apartheid government created these neighborhoods with the poorest, the furthest from the, uh, from the amenities, from work and other amenities, and the richest within or just on the perimeter of the cities, in peri-urban areas. And I dealt there with the right to the city, which commentators have welcomed. And I see that as a progressive development in questioning what is the state doing in achieving these, uh, these, uh, these rights to realize them progressively. And I also commend to you uh, Edwin Cameron's minority judgment in Gladla, where he took an interesting approach, different from the majority, which is, I think, I would suggest is along the lines of the approach I took in Tubakhale. I cite these two cases in conclusion to Akhale and Gladla to show that the apex court's right to housing jurisprudence is evolving slowly but surely. The fact that both Gladla and Tubakhale were minority judgments does not detract from this point. Stuart Wilson is right when he points out that the transformative potential of individual judgments is often not immediately apparent. The reason for that is because changes in the law create the potential for changes in practice but they need to be exploited and acted upon. It creates spaces for agents of change to act in those spaces. Peterson points out in his work that the rights work slowly. And he makes an interesting observation. He says, with hindsight, initial skepticism, he was one of them, after Hrudbum, that jud judicial vindication of the constitutional right to housing would make little difference to those excluded from South African cities was premature. Not only did the judgment eventually deliver, not to Mrs. Hrudbom, sadly, but to its applicant community what it promised, it also bestow bestowed on civil society and the le legal community crucial jurisprudential platforms from which, over time, far more broadly transformative gains could be leveraged, and I end the quote. At the start, you'll recall, I said that I'm starting, I'm only starting the conversation on this important topic. It is important, uh, my friends, that, that we must create space for opposing voices. And I've quoted, as I've said, David Birchitz and also in particular Sandy Liebenberg uh, at length because they are the most strident of critics of what I, what I propound and what the court has, has in its jurisprudence. Now, for some other reason, I was appointed an honorary professor at this venerable institution. I heard somewhere that a prof Professor means to profess your public knowledge, your knowledge publicly. In other words, you must actually show that you know something. And when I saw that, I really got worried. <laughs> and you know, the DVC, Professor Lavac said in the beginning, she said she mustn't make the mistake of saying the distinguished dean's lecture. I think that was actually proper. It was the distinguished dean's lecture. <laughs> and I can't think of a less distinguished fellow and I say fellow, I mean men and women standing here than myself. But thank you for that honor. Having made it as an appointed honorary professor here, I shall make it my mission, I promise, to invite those oppo opposing voices and others who share my approach to come and visit us at UWC and to give us insights into this very important debate. So what I propose doing is to invite critics like David Birchett and Sandy Liebenberg and others to come and speak to students and professors and lecturers alike, and also those from the profession who would like to come and, and even judges. And uh, I, I suspect those on that side of the, uh, of the fence, mostly academics, and of course those on the other side of the fence would be my retired colleagues like Edwin Cameron and Johan Froenemann and Sisi Kampepe. I said tongue in cheek to my colleagues when we were having a meeting earlier that, I mean judges when they retire their salaries continue, so these people must work for our taxpayers' money, so. <laughs> We we'll let them come here and talk. And, and I foresee a, a, a lively debate, lectures like this. And I hope at the end of, of, of the year, next year, or, or maybe later if, if time doesn't allow us, but at the end we'll round it off this topic with a panel discussion which I will facilitate as the only judge who can still be, uh, be disciplined of those who are judges. So that I am a facilitator and I don't have to say too much. To facilitate a panel discussion with all these people, or most of them, 
and see whether we find some sort of commonality in voices. And even if we don't, it's always good to debate issues on which we oppose each other. Ladies and gentlemen, our court finds itself on the horns of a dilemma. We're incredibly busy. I was bemoaning to A.B. Aman, my good friend at the back, who, when I was a young advocate, sent me some work. Thank you, A.B. You, you got uh, Rowena and our daughter, Corn. You kept us alive. And <laughs> his namesake, A.B. Dawson, as well. You ca I can't tell you how much I, I value that, because in those days, we didn't get much work. <clears throat> so mine is not the last but the first of many voices. And we find ourselves on the horns of a dilemma. We are under incredible political pressure. And we, we find ourselves in a space where everybody thinks that the court must get it right. And even more worryingly, people think that the Constitution must solve South Africa's problems. So that the Constitution is not a magic wand. I was pleasantly surprised on a recent trip to Dublin there at the university where I spoke. Uh, amongst many chief justices around the, around the world and, uh, and, and eminent professors, and then off to Oxford for some lectures where again, postgraduate students and their professors, all of them expressed their great admiration for, for our constitution and for what the work that the court is doing. That is, a, it, it, was, it was pleasantly revealing because we get much criticism from South Africa where there is now uh, a stronger lobby for constitutional abolition. And an eminent politician said the other day, we must go back to parliamentary sovereignty. So I said we're on the horns of a dilemma. Let me, uh, with Nico breathing down my neck, end on this note. Many, many years ago, some of you may remember him. He was one of the first black judges in South Africa. Fikile Bam, we used to call him Rafiks. In the, in the mid-90s, he became a judge, and he was the first president of the land claims court. Now, that, you will understand when the Land claims court was established. It had to wait for cases to come to it. So they were appointed in the Gauteng High Division and then seconded to the land claims court. And when the land claims court wasn't sitting there, it was sitting cases in Gauteng. So he was doing a case, criminal case with some Zulu speaking accused. Now Fix knows uh, Zulu, of course. But uh, there was an interpreter interpreting uh, because there was an English speaking white gentleman testifying for the state. And this gentleman said, well, you know, um, it was really, as he was giving his narrative, it was really creating a big problem for us. We were on the horns of a dilemma. And the interpreter says in Zulu to the accused, the three accused, he says, this man says that it was a very difficult thing. He says he found himself on the horns of an animal that I've never seen before. <laughs> and he said, but let, let, he said to the accused in Zulu, let this man continue. Maybe this animal will become clearer to me later. <laughs> And that's where we are at the moment as the Constitutional Court. We're hoping for this animal to become clearer. <laughs> I'm told that now that I've reached the end of this marathon, I'm sorry for exceeding my time. Um, but you know, when you become a professor, I mean, it's really novel. I mean, you must make, <laughs> make the most of it. You would think that I'm getting paid for this. <clears throat> I want to tell you, the other day, I went to see my minister in Bryanston in our church. <clears throat> and uh, he said he was going to come, but I don't see him here. His son is an alumnus from, of this university because they are down here at the moment in Cape Town. And his son studied here as well. He's very proud of it, like I am. And he related this story. I said to him, you know, I've got to give this lecture, but there's that thing they call Q and A time there. I don't like that thing. He says, you know what you must do? He says, there was a, years, many years ago a professor he had a particular field in which he was very good. It wasn't necessarily law, but the professor was good in that field. And he was invite, sorry, invited all over. But he was old, and uh, he lost his bearings often. So he got a driver. And so the driver would take him around and listen to the same lecture over and over. And once they went to university, and the driver said to him, you know, prof, I know this lecture so well, I can give it myself. <laughs> so the professor says, let's give it a go. He says, but you must be careful. There's a thing they call Q&A. That's the, that's the troublesome part. Because, I mean, you prepare, but you don't know what these people are going to ask. He says, no, professor. I'll stretch that talk so long that there's no time for Q&A. <laughs> and that's what I've been trying to do. <laughs> so they go in, and this, they change. They take, he puts on the, the driver's uh, cap and his, and his dust coat. And he himself sits at the back, and this driver give, gives the lecture. Gives an excellent lecture. 
And then he says, Q&A time, and there's questions firing from the floor. And they say, well, he says, I'll take all the questions. I don't want to deal with them, but, but, but I'll take all the questions. And, then, <laughs> and after the questions, he says, you know, these questions are so simple. I am going to ask my chauffeur there at the back <laughs> to answer these questions so that you can see how nonsensical these questions are. Even, even he can answer now. I don't see my driver here. <laughs> Thank you very much. What a wonderful lecture. You seem to be already a professor. A professor knows exactly the length of a lecture, which is about 45 minutes, and then you stop. <laughs> so, wonderful. I thought that the openness of which you tackled the topic, the directness that you tackled a very difficult one, very contentious issue to be I would say courageous in the open, yeah, you can hide behind your judge, uh, judgments, uh, questions can be written to it, but yeah, you say this is an open question, we must engage, and that you are going to engage with it. Um, your openness about being the court and having to come with answers, you see yourself as the last, um, as the last stop we see you as the last bastion. That if everything else fails, there's the court. And that pressure from society, from politics, is immense. So let us have this conversation. You invited, you invited controversy. You didn't shy away from the tough question. So uh, any questions, we'll get a couple, and I think, you know, Perhaps you can jog. Are you driving him tonight? <laughs> <laughs> or where's our socioeconomic place? Okay. Any any questions that you have? Yes. Isaac. Um, I was really looking at what you said here, being a social gas statement. I think that you could go back to Salvador and see that Parliament is a, as I say, court sector under We should rather go and try to, if we can't develop the, uh, the separation of powers, because I think it will become outdated. It's, it's, as you say, it's a European idea. And um, the challenges that we are facing in terms of interpreting the written text, I think that's what the court is trying to say to the judge, that, that they know there must be something else, but they are bound by this rule of interpretation. we all frowned upon and brought in the Constitution as the answer, and the answer is not there, then we didn't have the correct answer. So, since you are going to be the professor, there is a field for you to study and to develop. Thanks, Mr. Jenica. We haven't seen ages, 30 years we probably have seen each other. Right, any, any other question? Yeah, at the back. Another old student. Welcome. <laughs> Good evening. My surname is Master. I'm fortunate to be employed in a capacity where I am able to deal with the Constitution on a daily basis. I'm at the provincial uh, parliament in the Western Cape. Uh, Justice Majid, I, you, you represent quite a bit for me as I'm sitting here. I will just make this one observation, Prof. Stately, if you don't mind. Uh, when I started out here as a first year, then uh, at the time, Justice Majid was in his, fi in his final year and represented quite an 
a personification of an aspiration. And with you coming back here and with me in my current professional capacity, it just closes loops in so many ways. Now, and because I'm aware of, of your, your personal and professional trajectory, I can very easily say, and pardon me if I'm, if I'm not right, I can very easily say that you represent an activist who happens to be a judge. And that informs your worldview and the number of inarticulate premises that inform your assessment of your, your professional responsibility. Following what you have shared with us now in terms of the judgments and the minority judgments, etc., it appears to me, and, and my, my classmate, former classmate Jenica mentioned this now, that we have a clash of paradigms. Your colleagues on the bench, whoever they may be and whatever their backgrounds may be, I seem to observe that there's a paradigm contradiction. They come across in the judgments as much more positivistic as opposed to a social activistic role that you seem to have enveloped for yourself. That's the one observation. But I want to link with what Jenica has mentioned. Because you see, uh, just by the way, brackets, we can never go back to a parliamentary sovereignty, close bracket. I want to link with what he has said earlier. Because you see, this, this thing, this, this thing called separation of powers, and it is because of that doctrine that your bench is stopping short. That's why we have a casualty in the form of a dead litigant in the form of Grootboom. That's why we have a situation where people wait for houses during our democracy for 26 plus years. And what is that thing? Separation of powers. Because it keeps you and your bench just short of giving an imperative to government. Separation of powers, to me, is a, it is a paralyzing doctrine. It imposes a paralysis on that one bastion, which is the courts. And maybe the, the interrogation should be, how do we get the courts as that bastion to put an imperative and just dilute this doctrine? Because you know what happens, as we know, Parliament is the lawmaker. Often we have situations, and positively so, where Parliament, where, where courts, where the uh, apex court tell Parliament that a declaration of invalidity is suspended for X number of months. That can almost be viewed as straggling, straggling within the legislative uh, domain. Almost be viewed. Similarly, I'm arguing, especially if it is along an interpretation as the one in, in, um, in the case that you're busy with now that's been sent back to the High Court three times, where housing is critical, as we know, there should be a space, jurisprudentially prudent, for an apex court, the last bastion, to make that imperative judgment on the executive and with them being in charge of their resources, that's a conversation on its own. Okay, but we need to. Uh, with them being in charge the of the resources, Gareth, so, so for the apex conclude. court to make that imperative for them to come to the party within certain time frame. Put a time frame also on the executive to impose and give uh, a life to the constitution via the second generation rights. Thank, pardon, thank pardon the extended. Uh, yeah. Good. I'm going to take a third question and then we. Uh, uh, ask the uh, uh, judge to the uh, justice to, to respond and then we can have another round. Yes, th there was a question there. Justice Majid, thank you for the uh, very thought-provoking prov keynote. My name is Angela van der Baag. I am wondering what you think climate change and the impacts of climate change and the climate crisis is or is going to be 
on our current and future interpretation of socioeconomic rights. Section 24 is also a socioeconomic right, and earlier in this year, a court said that as far as climate change and air quality in that case, before the court was concerned, it, was, it should be regarded as an immediately realizable right, which is conflicting to how we interpret reasonableness and progressiveness or progressive rights that are progressively realizable. And that, add, that adds just another layer to the complexity of the wording in the Constitution. So I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Thank you. Uh, I know Ishmael and Romeo very well, and they think they want me to lose my job. <clears throat> Separation of powers are very difficult, as you, as you have rightly uh, indicated. It's something that we must be very, very careful about. You know, um, I'm hesitant to repeat it, but I think what he said is true, is uh, the former Deputy Chief Justice who was the first to present these distinguished lectures uh, at some point uh, at the gathering, which was supposed to be private, but which became public knowledge, made the observation that when one writes a constitution, you, you don't write it as if Pro Mr. Nelson Mandela will be president forever. You write it worst case scenario. And when you look at this constitution, the extensive powers that a president has without adequate checks and balances, you understand what he, what he was alluding to. And so when we talk about separation of powers, we must be very careful that we maintain constitutional objectivity. Constitutional objectivity means that when you decide a case, you are less concerned with the facts and the actors, the dramatis personae in the case, than with the principles. Because you as an apex court are gonna set precedent that's gonna bind other courts. So to take a crass example, I mean, we're now busy with the case, and I'm wondering whether I should mention the name, but it's public knowledge that the case is before us. It's the Janus Valus parole, parole case. It's a very, very hard case. You will understand why I'm saying that. But you've got to forget that it's Janus Valus who shot, who I think is the greatest leader South Africa would have had after Mandela's Stempasi Lekrasani, and almost plunged us into civil war. You've got to forget who he is and look at the law. So I'm saying all of that because when you talk about separation of powers, you cannot, as a judge, say to, let's take the Western Cape Provincial Legislature. You cannot say to them, let's take, let's take Wallace Dean. You must allocate so much of the budget to those 5,000 or whatever people to create housing for them. You can't. I wish I could, but I can't. Because I do not know what their budget constraints are. I do not know how they have worked out. Because remember, budget is a long process. I mean, people come in the smallest units. Those of you who have worked in the public service, in the smallest unit, they would go to the bigger unit, and that unit would say, well, I'm going to chop off this, or there's not enough money. And so they go up until it gets to the head of department who says, well, let's take this to the budget committee, and the budget committee will take it to uh, to the executive council that you call in the Western Cape the provincial cabinet, and they will debate it. And the minister of, of, of finance, uh, your provincial minister, will, will fight as much as possible to contain the budget because you've got to prioritize. And we as judges, we don't know anything about that. There's no evidence before us. And so it's a hard choice to make, but we've got to stay in our lane. Otherwise, the system won't work. We are already under pressure as a court, as an apex court, uh, of people who say that we are wielding too much power. And I mean, let's be, let's be honest, it's mostly the politicians who say so, that we are trying to govern the country. Well, far from it, that's the last thing I, I uh, no, let me not say it, it's, it's, it sounds offensive. But <laughs> I, I just want to say politician is one of the very last jobs I would take, probably the last one. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to govern. And you mentioned uh, declarations of invalidity where we suspend the declaration and, and give parliament time to remedy the defect. But we often do reading in where we say, while parliament is busy with its work, the offensive clause, the impugned clause, shall read as follows, and we insert words to remove the, cons the constitutional offensive offensiveness. 
We did it recently, and I, I mean, it was written as a beautiful judgment. Uh, if you love beautiful judgments on very intricate subjects, read Blind S.A. as the president of South Africa. It's a beautiful judgment written by an acting judge, Unterhalter. It concerns the, the shortcomings of the Copyright Act as far as blind and visually impaired people are concerned. It's a wonderful judgment. And the point in that judgment is that it was clear on all the papers before us, and government conceded it, that they've been dragging their feet for years while our visually impaired and blind compatriots have no access to resources. I mean, and it didn't affect us, I promise you. One of the judgments, supporting judgments for blind essay was made by Justice Zach Yacoub. As, as, as you all know, he's been blind from a very young age. And he said how they were dependent on, on, on sources which are like third-hand or fourth-hand sources. Uh, until they, as he was growing up, there was nothing. And so, and so we, 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 in that case, I had to decide. Parliament had dragged its feet and we were given a bill. Uh, and we were urged to say, take this section, I think it's section 41, capital A. And if you want to read in, insert that, that clause. That is before Parliament now being debated. Well, the amici and the blind essay indicated to us the shortcomings in that clause. And we went way beyond that. There's a treaty called the Marrakesh Treaty, which deals with, with, uh, with legislation on, 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 on blind and visually impaired people. And we went beyond the clause in the bill, and we almost followed the Marrakesh Treaty, except for, a, for an adjustment here. Now there, people can say, well, you guys are legislating. You've even gone beyond what is before Parliament, and uh, you would know that that comes from, from government and, uh, and from the Portfolio Committee, which is dominated by the ruling party. So, you guys are legislating, you are going beyond what we anticipate will, will pass through Parliament. Well, let me not say no more, uh, say no more because that bill may well come, when, if it's passed, come back to the court on constitutionality. So I'll say no more, but if you read that judgment and you see what we've done in that order, it's a long order, it's probably two or three pages, then people will point a finger and say, well, you guys are legislating. So you've got to be very careful, Romeo and, uh, and, uh, and Isaac. I mean, I, I get where you come from, and it's that frustrating of, you feel that the country is heading towards an abyss. We are on the precipice. And the court must rescue you. The court must. Uh, I've got a grandchild now. He loves watching Paw Patrol. I mean, I know Paw Patrol. I know all the characters there. <laughs> it's like Paw Patrol. You call them, and they come in, and they sort everything out. <laughs> well, we can't, much as we would like to. And uh, we've got to stay in our lane. That's the one thing that we must do, however much frustrating it is. And sometimes you sit there and say, but I can pull out my hair. You know, it's receding rapidly. My wife always reminds me. But, but you can't. You got to, you got to have fidelity to this is, uh, is, what, is, is what is essential. And then your, your question on, 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 on environmental law, that is a, going to be one of our biggest challenges. And I want, don't want to say too much, uh, not because I don't know the answer. Well, that too, but... You would know that it's got the same proviso through, le uh, through reasonable legislative and other measures, uh, the right to a clean environment. But all I can say is that I, I agree with you that there's a strong case to be made out for this right to be immediately realizable. But you've got to get past the text. And the reason why I'm reluctant is you will know that there's uh, uh, there's um, litigation coming from the Eastern Cape about this underwater seismic blasting and so on. That's sure to, head, to, head, to, to end up in our court. So let me no, say no more, otherwise I have to recuse myself and, uh, I mean, you can recuse yourself only so much, then you see, this guy is lazy. <laughs> but I can take it no further than that, like people always say in argument before court, I can take it no further than this, is to say that I think I'm with you. Until I decide the case, then I'll have to decide it properly. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, any last questions? There's some refreshments waiting. Yes. Uh, the Medi Clinic major between Medi Clinic and Matlosina, which was prohibited. I think perhaps with majors, uh, it's simpler in the sense that you can prohibit it, but then when it comes to your um, uh, 
prohibited practices such as your cartels and your excessive pricing, uh, what kind of remedies, if you can speak on that without necessarily speaking for the constitutional court, what kind of remedies would we have in mind where we want, for example, to enforce the right to access to healthcare in light of, uh, instead, access to essential medicines. For example, at the start of the year, the commission found that um, some pharmaceutical companies were excessively pricing breast, care med breast cancer medication. So my question really is how, what kind of remedies would we fashion or, or create in order to, um, to, to realize those constitutional rights in the event that those issues are eventually litigated through to the Constitutional Court. Thank you. To giving free legal advice, but uh, <laughs> yes, uh, let's get the last question for you. Thank you, Professor. I am Kusha Georgia, a third year LLP student here at UWC. Uh, my question to you, Justice, is why is it that we hear less of the African values in social saying that the minimum core argument in relation to socio-economic rights is unsustainable jurisprudentially. I'm just interested to know, the Concord has on a number of occasions in relation to privacy, in Bernstein and so forth, said that privacy has a minimum core that is inviolable. It seems to me that if privacy as a fundamental right can have a minimum core, why would socio-economic rights not be able to have a minimum call. Thank you. Excellent question. I'm going to take them uh, in that order. Competition law, uh, I'll be honest with you, is not my forte, but I think you'll agree that in MediClinic, you will know that there was a split decision. The minority said we don't have jurisdiction. But when you read the, the competition appeal court's judgment, you'll know that it was split. Uh, Rogers J.A. was now Rogers J. in our court, wrote the, the majority decision can't remember who agreed with him, and then the minority decision was written by, uh, what is Bashir's last name, Just Judge Valley. And we upheld Valley. Now, you would know that the majority took a very narrow purview. Uh, they saw the right as a very narrow purview and the question of prohibited practice of that big merger between, between the, the big three and, and then, uh, and then um, the, the, the other group, the, the smaller group on the side. Whereas Judge Valley took a much wider view and he brought in the right in Section 27 to access to health care. And we, the majority, the Chief Justice, former Chief Justice McCoying wrote that judgment. I was one of those who concurred with him. I think you'll agree that if you look at that judgment, the Constitutional Court has gone much further than it ever has been. And that judgment, too, has been criticized. You see, some, we get criticized on the one side for not going far enough, and in that judgment, those who profess to know competition law, I don't, uh, they say we went too far. And so, and so I think that judgment is really an advertisement for the court progressively moving as far as competition law is concerned by encapsulating in those principles rights like the right to access to healthcare because that was primary in our view how this merger would make it impossible for, for especially the indigent to access healthcare services in that Clarksville, uh, Pochostrom area, in the Clockway, Clockway municipality, and the, and the other one, and so and so, I do believe that we are moving in that direction. But it's easier to do it in a competition law case, where it's prohibited practices, where it concerns a fundamental right like access to healthcare. It's 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 less easy to do it, for example, with hotels. I would suggest you could do it for pharmaceuticals as well, because that too is a right access to healthcare. Most of the competition law cases that we see are cases of collusion. You know, people, people collude about prices. I mean, we, we're busy writing a judgment now on the 2010 World Cup stadiums where 
large construction companies colluded on pricing so that uh, there was no real competition. And so it's a difficult question, but I think if you read Mary Clinic, we are moving in that direction. And uh, I hope we continue along that route. I, it's a case that gives me much hope. The, you are absolutely right about, the, about African uh, socioeconomic jurisprudence. So one of the things that we in the court are acutely aware of, and uh, one of the things that we discussed on, on my trip recently is why is there so little African uh, socioeconomic, or well, not only socioeconomic, but African uh, jurisprudence in your, in your judgments? And I plead guilty. I mean, my colleagues and I would readily admit that uh, we haven't given enough regard because, I mean, there are some wonderful constitutions and jurispr jurisprudential uh, precedent on the continent from Kenya, even our, our neighbor Namibia, uh, less so Zimbabwe, of course, but, but we need to follow it, and you're absolutely right. And uh, one, of, the, uh, one of, the, uh, of those who were part of the community law center here in the early days, Jacques and others you'll remember was, uh, Nico you'll remember was uh, Yvonne Mokoro, who really uh, popularized Ubuntu in our court, and I think that's the way to go. The last question, uh, when you talk about Bernstein, you must remember that Bernstein, in Bernstein, what the court said was privacy, the right to privacy is relative in the sense that, and I'm paraphrasing the judgment, but the, the key component of that judgment says is the closer you move to the individual's inner sanctum, is the words they use, the more your right to privacy is protected and free speech must be trumped by that right. Now, those are, for example, your, your relations between whether you have a relationship with someone of a different sex than you or with the same sex, that kind of, and what you do in your bedroom is your business. And, uh, and that inner sanctum is what Bernstein versus Bester speaks about. We are debating that at the moment in a, in a fascinating case which, which I, I was fortunate to get to write uh, actually, I shouldn't say that, but just ignore that. <laughs> it's a case which concerns corporate. Can a corporate sue? Well, a corporate can sue for defamation, but can a corporate sue for general damages? You would know that general damages gets awarded for loss of affection, for, for your impairment of your dignity. Does a corporation have dignity? A fascinating case that we're writing about. And there, the question of Bernstein versus Bester comes in. How can a corporation say, well, this is my inner sanctum, this is my privacy, this is my, my dignity, when, when, uh, when and it's about environmental activists that fiercely criticized it publicly uh, uh, sand dune mining. And, uh, and in that context, I would suggest it's different than socioeconomic rights because here we're talking about the inner sanctum of the, of the, of the, of the being. When we talk about socioeconomic rights, we must uh, remember that those rights are still subject to, uh, to that caveat, to that proviso in the act, because the right to privacy doesn't have that. I mean, you, you know what the right of privacy says. And we try to be true to the text. I, I can't emphasize enough that you, must ha you, you may have how much influence as a judge in the highest court, but if you don't remain true to this, then you've, then you've lost, you've lost track, you've moved out of your lane. And, and I would suggest that there is a considerable difference between those two, the inner sanctum of the, of the privacy right and uh, the right to uh, uh, socioeconomic rights, which are those provisors. I know I'm at the end and I, and, and I shouldn't say anything more, but I want to say something finally to those students who are here. And I said it before when I was still in the SCA and I, I related to the professors this afternoon. A few years ago, when I was still in the SEA, I was invited by the Law Students Council to speak at their farewell banquet dinner. And the thing I spoke about that was close to my heart is because of the love that I have for this institution is to say to students who are here, whether you are undergraduate, postgraduate, or, or doctor students, you must never, ever let people say to you that you come from an inferior, inferior institution. Because that's what happened to us. And when I was an advocate, I had to work harder and show, to show people that I belong there. And uh, when I became a judge, people said, uh, what is this darky doing in our place here? I had to work harder than the others. And I was so delighted to hear how Professor Lavak related how UWC is now in one of the, as well, is in the top 10 law faculties. Long may it continue and, and, and may it improve even further. Always assert yourself 
because the other day I saw a master's stu uh, a student who, uh, we've got a constitutional court trust, I'm the trustee there, and he won a, f a fellowship uh, for LLM to the States, and he comes from UWC, and I was on the panel, I chaired the panel, and afterwards when he was successful, I called him in. And I said to him, this is what was my experience at UWC, and I related to him, the law students gone. He says, it's still like that, a little, a little bit, uh, much less, but it's still like that. Assert yourself, UWC, is the best, regardless of what they say. And, 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 and don't let anybody tell you differently. Thanks, thank you very much. Uh, let me hand it over to the uh, distinguished dean to uh, <laughs> say a few distinguished marks, remarks about a distinguished lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Nico. Uh, I was sitting there and feeling very guilty because it's called the Dean's Distinguished Lecture, but I'm doing nothing. <laughs> so, um, yes, this is actually a faculty event, and I just want to say thank you to, to everybody who, who made this event possible tonight. But let me start with, um, with, our, um, with our keynote speaker, Justice Majid. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me. This was uh, very insightful and also very entertaining. So thank you, Justice Majid. Um, Farida Hendricks has a gift uh, also to Mrs. Uh, to Mrs. Majid. Um, so thank you. That's coming. <laughs> Farida, thank you. And to everybody on stage tonight, uh, Professor Lavac, thank you for coming out of your sabbatical to welcome us here, Professor Staitler uh, and Professor Fesser, much appreciated. Um, to all of you, uh, those who are watching the live stream and also who are here in, in, in person, I really appreciate it and thank you very much to all of you for, for coming. And then there are many people in the background that you would have seen uh, working, so I'm going to, uh, to, to just mention uh, some of the things that they did. I may leave out one or two names, please forgive me if I do. Um, Hazel Jefter and Herschel Zimri, who coordinated uh, this event for Art Hendricks, who was responsible for the sound and the video. Nshlanshla Mutsanane, the photos and uh, putting us on Facebook. Uh, Chepo Morekure, who was uh, carrying everything over here and setting up the place. Um, uh, lots of people working in the venue itself. You would have seen Ronwen Valentine, Lauren Haupt, Tracy Oliphant, uh, Lizelle van Graan, Vernon Johannes, Elizabeth Witten, also Adele Roda, Isetu Sonchete, um, uh, all of, to, to all of them. Uh, great thanks, and to, Sher to Cheryl Davids as well, uh, Willie Hayes, who was the judge, and uh, who did many of the, the behind-the-scenes things. Um, to IA, uh, who was also here tonight, and ABS, perhaps ICS as well, I'm not sure, uh, but to all of them, a big thank you. And um, now, please uh, join us for some refreshments outside and enjoy the rest of the evening with us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>